As the bitter memories of the reunification war began to fade, the Star League transitioned into the next chapter of its existence, commonly referred to as either the Good Years, the Century of Peace, or the Golden Age. This period of relative calm lasted for most of the 27th century, with only a few disturbances along the way. During this time, the Star League soared to undreamt of new heights and all benefited from its advancements. There was, however, a spectre hanging over the League, and as humanity entered the 28th century, the cracks began to surface. The three hidden wars of the Star League would bring it to the brink, and the two succession crises shook the High Council. Before long, old resentments flared up, and the member states were at each other's throats. Only a great statesman such as First Lord Cameron had a chance of overcoming the turmoil and binding the disparate nations back together. All this, however, was over a hundred years away when Nicholas Cameron became the Star League's new First Lord in 2602. He would rule for the better part of five decades throughout the period known as the Good Years, but it would be a mistake to think that this was a time free from strife. The name comes not from the fact that the new Star League was perfect, but rather that those issues humanity faced were resolved without the use of war, a stark contrast to the preceding 200 years of history. By far the largest threat faced by the Star League in the aftermath of the Reunification War was an internal one. For decades, Leonard Curita had been touring his realm, visiting houses of ill repute and siring many illegitimate children. In the early 27th century, he became obsessed with the idea of tracking them all down, and dispatched his military on pointless errands to find them. It did not go unnoticed that the direction he dispatched many of them in was towards the Terran hegemony. This foolish act of hostility became deadly serious when in February 2602, the Third Sword of Light landed on Asta, a jointly held world and demilitarized zone. The DCMS forces departed before the SLDF arrived, with a dozen children in tow. When questioned on his actions, Leonard accused the First Lord of trying to keep his children from him. Tensions only grew from there, and Ian Cameron, in one of his last acts as First Lord, dispatched the newly formed Tenth Corps to fortify the border. Such was the threat to the stability of the Star League. In 2604, things came to a climactic head. During a High Council meeting, Leonard lunged at Nicholas Cameron, repeating the accusations about his stolen children. After the two were separated by the other council lords, Leonard threw his wine bottle at the First Lord. One of his guards, Tanya Kerensky, interposed herself between the bottle and her lord, but when she was hit, she accidentally discharged her weapon, which came within a hair's breadth of hitting the coordinator. Leonard drew a knife and attacked Kerensky, fatally stabbing her twice, then fled the scene. Back on New Samarkand, Curator began preparations for all-out war. By February 2605, his fleet and attendant army had finished mustering at Benjamin, and was about to launch an offensive when Leonard mysteriously took ill. His campaign never began, as the coordinator died a few weeks later. Nobody took credit for what everyone knew was an assassination, but decades later it was discovered to be the work of Sidowen McAllister, Leonard's grandmother. In the aftermath, Leonard's son Blaine took on the role of coordinator, but passed away later that year. So it was that Sidowen McAllister became coordinator of the Draconis Combine for the third time in her life, aged 108. On December 7, 2607, the four periphery realms were inducted into the Star League as associate members. By this point, the reconstruction efforts within the territorial states had been underway for 10 years. Many Inner Sphere businesses had been enticed to set up new operations out in the periphery to take advantage of cheap labour and plentiful resources. At first there had been some controversy over the fact that it was Inner Sphere companies who were getting the Star League contracts and not local businesses, but as the balance improved, the member states would soon find themselves in economic trouble. First to feel the pinch was the Capellan Confederation. As the only realm that had not taken part in the fighting, they benefited the least from the post-war boom. In fact, it was quite the opposite. Chancellor Ursula Liao had taken advantage of the fact that the SLDF's best route for reaching the magistracy in Concordat took them through Capellan space and began charging the so-called cattle tax for each soldier crossing our borders. When the war ended and this massive source of revenue dried up, the Capellan economy reeled. Ursula Liao passed away just before the turn of the century and had no children to take up the post of Chancellor. It fell to the Prefectorate to nominate a replacement, and they made the unconventional choice of Norman Aris, the last survivor of the family that had once ruled the Capellan hegemony 300 years earlier. This decision was largely a placatory one, as the Liao family had become deeply unpopular within the Star League as a result of Ursula's actions and her inaction in other regards. To save his nation from economic collapse, Aris implemented a number of aggressive state-socialist economic policies that gave him the ability to uproot entire family groups, 
retrain them for an assigned role, and then deploy them to any world as needed. The Capellan citizens would have to sacrifice their freedoms for the good of the state. While these policies ultimately succeeded, and by 2610 the economy had recovered, these freedoms were never reinstated. The Capellan Chancellor still has this power today. The ruling family within the Lyran Commonwealth was caught in a vicious feud in the early 27th century. Kevin Steiner Dinesen's father Robert had died back in 2597, not long after the death of Kevin's mother the Archon, while en route to Tharkad to serve as an advisor. At the time, his death was ruled natural, but over the next dozen years, 11 more prominent members of the Dinesen family, plus 7 Steiners, would drop dead under mysterious circumstances. Kevin began 2611 by reforming the Estates General for the first time in almost two decades after his mother disbanded them in the wake of Henry Graham's attempted coup. The following year, he launched an investigation into the deaths of his family members, which ultimately concluded that the Denisons were responsible for trying to supplant the ruling Steiners. The outcome of this led Kevin to drop the Denison half of his name. Though his sister, who would become Archon after him, still used the Steiner Denison name, she would be the last to do so. In the 2620s, the Star League proposed the idea of a unified currency to ease the challenges involved in trading between nations. Most were in support of the idea, but Kevin Steiner feared that this would weaken the Lyran position and used his executive powers to overrule his own government. In response, mass strikes broke out across the Commonwealth, forcing the Archon to back down. In 2623, the Star League dollar, sometimes called the Cameron Bill or Sea Bill, became the official currency of the League. The last major event that happened within the Lyran quadrant of space almost changed the face of the Inner Sphere as we know it. By 2643, things were going so well for the Star League that many within the Commonwealth were questioning whether its continued existence was even necessary. Why were they paying for two bureaucracies when the Star League alone would suffice? This movement swept through the Estates General until it seemed almost certain that they would vote themselves out of existence. Only the last minute impassioned plea by the Archon himself won the day for the Commonwealth. The final voting results were 160 for dissolution and 161 against. It's impossible to predict how history might have changed had it gone the other way. Kevin Steiner passed away four years later in 2647. In the Draconis Combine, Sidema McAllister's third stint as coordinator was brought to a premature end when her ministers essentially forced her into retirement. Her wisdom and authority was unquestioned, but her advanced age made running the Combine a real challenge for her. Nevertheless, her choice of replacement, Saintfia Curita, gave her someone who she could continue to pull the strings of and rule by proxy. Saintfia's term was marked by a number of significant cultural shifts within the Combine. The first was the shock announcement of the construction of a new capital city on Luthien and the relocation of the Draconis government to that planet. New Samarkand, the ancestral home of House Curita, was deemed too far away from the Lyran border to be able to conduct a successful defence, or offence, in the case of invasion. Luthien's more central location gave them a better strategic hold over the entire region, plus gave her populace a major project to work towards. The completion of Imperial City took decades, only concluding towards the end of the century. Saint Curita, who was a major patron of the arts, also started a revival of interest in ancient Japanese culture within the Combine. Though certain elements of this had always been of significance to the Curita family, it was during her reign as coordinator, and encouraged by her successor, Yurizin II, that it really took off with the public too. The ruling Curitans took advantage of this and pushed the parts that stressed obedience to one's elders or master. This has been one of the many ways they have managed to maintain such a high level of control over their realm's population for so many centuries. Sedo and McAllister finally passed away in 2632, aged 136. She is almost certainly the most powerful woman in the history of the Draconis Combine. Her three terms as coordinator are unequalled, as are the suspected murders of two of her predecessors, her husband Warren back in 2517 and her grandson Leonard in 2605. The Free Worlds League had invested the most of any Innisfair nation into the rebuilding of the periphery, especially within the magistracy. Melissa Humphrey's good neighbour policies had kicked off a major economic boom for the Canopians. Their new state-of-the-art facilities, paired with the nation determined to prove their worth, soon created issues for the mercantile freeworlders, who found their ageing industrial base could not keep up with the flood of goods coming across the border. For most of the 2620s, the Free Worlds League was suffering a major recession, and they were only able to claw themselves out of this hole with the emergence of several new technologies. 
The early 27th century had been less traumatic for the Federated Sons and Terran hegemony compared to their fellow member states. The only significant event occurred with the handover of the former Taurian worlds to the Fed Sons, who were thrilled to have another two dozen planets to exploit. On Terra, First Lord Ian Cameron had made it his mission to ensure that his realm would always be at the top of the pile, and launched several major research projects as part of his final act as First Lord, the Hegemony Ascendant Decree. Within the Star League Accords were several prescriptions about sharing technology, which were envisioned to keep the more advanced hegemony from having to share its secrets, particularly military ones, with their neighbours. The most significant development to come out of this period was the Hyperpulse Generator. This advancement would make possible the instantaneous transfer of information and communications from one star system to another, without the need for courier jumpships. Though it was limited in range, in the early days it was no greater than that of the safe jump distance, it would still revolutionise the way people lived. The project was begun by Joshua Hashiko on April 4th, 2614, but they couldn't overcome some of the fundamental challenges until Cassie de Burke joined the program in February 2616. De Burke, who was a free world scientist trying to overcome the same problems, often goes uncredited in the development of the HPG, and her name is all but unknown outside of the Marek League. Ultimately, it would take until January 1st, 2630 for the first successful broadcast between Terra and New Earth. The second major advancement was the development of the JU Water Purifier. This device not only outperformed its predecessors, but it was also smaller by an order of magnitude. Suddenly it became economical to colonise worlds that would never have been visited in the past. This truly ended all the economic troubles for the various states, as it opened up untapped sources of new raw materials and gave them new markets to sell to. By the end of the century, some estimates say as many as 1,000 new colonies had been established. In 2640, the First Lord's son, Joseph Cameron, launched a new tournament-style war game called the Martial Olympiad. Held every six years on Mars, the competition was likened to an Olympic Games for the military. The soaring popularity of Joseph's initiative was indicative of just how fashionable the military was during the age of the Star League. At first, only the SLDF could participate, but in later years the House militaries were invited, though none would ever be crowned the overall champion. The good years came to an end in the mid-27th century with the emergence of a crisis within the Rimworld's Republic. The Amaris family had spent the last few decades in turmoil, launching successive coups and counter-coups that wiped out most of the ruling line. Salanta Amaris had come to power at a young age and had already survived an attempt by her regents to have her removed. By the late 2540s, she was firmly placed at the head of the Republic, but sadly took ill with a rare form of cancer. While she was undergoing radical treatment, she promoted her ambitious young nephew Tadio, the Minister for Military Affairs, to rule in her place. His first actions as president were entirely predictable, and exactly what Salanta had secretly been hoping for. Tadio was too worried about the loyalty of the palace guard to consider a takeover in his aunt's absence, but one group he did trust was the Rimworld's army. He began to aggressively expand the RWA, and by 2650 it was stronger than it had ever been pre-reunification war. Clandestine funding for this expansion came in part from the Draconis Combine, who sought to destabilise their mutual neighbour, the Lyran Commonwealth. Naturally, this drew the attention of the Star League and the Council Lords. The Lyrans were particularly concerned about the military build-up on their border. Unfortunately, nothing about Amaris' actions were illegal, as the Rimworld's Republic was not subjected to the harsh controls that the other periphery realms were post-reunification war, but rather was a co-signatory of the SLDF defence protocols. This left the High Council with three options. The first was to do nothing, and potentially risk another Operation Mailed Fist if things got worse. The second was to launch a preemptive invasion themselves, thereby breaking all the laws of the Star League. The third option was to make Tadio's new army illegal. The Council Edict of 2650, which passed on November 15th, put strict limits on the numbers of soldiers the House militaries and other private armies could keep in active service. Directive 30 was one of the first laws passed by the new First Lord, Michael Cameron, and went a long way to achieving his great-grandfather Ian's dreams of the SLDF being an unmatched military juggernaut. Not everyone was happy with the new rules, however. The Draconis Combine, whose relationship with the Camerons had never fully recovered since Leonard's day, saw this as an attack on their sovereignty. This would lead Eurozen II to further undermine Star League authority within the Combine, and the member state moved ever further from unity. Tadio Amaris, meanwhile, was forced to disband much of his new force, or else risk military intervention, something he could not hope to win. By 2642, each of the SLDF's corps that had fought in the reunification war had grown to a full army of three or four corps each. 
to make sure that Amaris followed the new directive, the LCAF conducted military manoeuvres on Black Earth across the border. Five battle mech regiments and various support units were enough to intimidate the interim president into disbanding his new army. Salanta Amaris returned to power not long after the crisis. Everything had gone exactly how she had wanted. For starters, the RWA had grown in size as not all of Tadio's forces were sent home. The new limits on the RWA allow for 12 battle mech and 8 conventional regiments, a significant increase on the two combined arms regiments left after the reunification war. All this had been achieved without her name being associated with the build-up. Secondly, Tadia's reputation, and by extension his threat to her, had been tarnished irreparably by the Star League's actions. In the aftermath of the crisis, 30 brand new Pinto-class corvettes were left without a purpose. Rather than decommission and deconstruct them, Salanta chose to mothball the new fleet. They would have to wait for another 100 years, but those ships would eventually find a place in the navy of her great-grandson and participate in one of humanity's darkest chapters. The Rimworld standoff of 2650 is often viewed as the end of the so-called good years. While the Star League as a whole was still growing in strength, cracks were starting to form in the facade of unity, particularly within the Dragoners Combine. However, it was the Free Worlds that would next fall into crisis, with the emergence of a terror cell that almost spelled the end for House Marek altogether. In 2667, the scourge of death emerged on the scene with a terrorist bombing of an Atreus starport. This group was strongly opposed to the feudal societies that had emerged as a necessity of early space colonization. With the emergence of the HPG technology, they sought to bring an end to the Great Houses, including both the ruling Marix and House Cameron of the Star League, both of whom were perceived to be holding the Free Worlds back. Other attacks followed soon after, but it was their targeting of the Marek family estate that made them infamous. Terence Marek led the Free Worlds during this time of peace, adopting the title of Warden of the Perimeter Defences as opposed to Captain General. He was conducting a meeting of the Dormouth Council when a bomb planted beneath the library exploded, killing 39, the Warden and many of his close family among them. One individual who survived the blast, though only barely, was Gerald Marek, General of the 3rd Marek Militia. His prognosis wasn't good, but he clung to life, and through the extensive use of bionics was able to make a recovery. As the most senior member of the family left, he was sworn in as the new Captain General, and promptly made the extermination of the Scourge of Death his main priority. To that end, he massively expanded the Free World's intelligence agency, SAFE. Many civil liberties were sacrificed in the pursuit of the terrorists, and while initially he had public support and sympathy, this began to wane over time. As the first 10 years of his rule were coming to an end, Parliament was considering removing him from office. There were even some who claimed that the extent of his bionic implants had impaired his judgement and he could not even be classified as human anymore. This anti-bionic phenomena continues within the Free Worlds to this day, largely as a result of Gerald's actions. A major breakthrough happened in 2679 with the discovery of a Scourge base on Westover. Sifting through the compound, safe agents made a shocking discovery. They had stumbled upon near irrefutable proof that the Scourge of Death had received significant financial backing from House Salage. Gerald called the three leading members of the family to Atreus to stand trial, but unsurprisingly, none attended. On October 1st, 2679, the Salage family was tried in absentia, found guilty of treason, and sentenced to death. When the Salage family ordered their provincial forces to prepare for war, the High Council could see a civil war was in the offing. The Lyran Archon and Compelling Chancellor urged the First Lord to commit the SLDF to the fight to prevent it from getting out of control. However, Marek and Cameron saw their pleas for what they were, a pretense to get their own militaries moving across the border and seize any vulnerable worlds, in the name of defence of course. Jedal Manik was able to win the argument and received assurances that the SLDF would not become engaged and only provide humanitarian aid in the aftermath. He subsequently dispatched the Marek militia to Helos Minor, where they began the fight with the Regulan Hussars. It was a short campaign, as many of those fighting for Salaj were questioning their loyalties to the house that had seemingly funded and encouraged domestic terrorism. Harmony fell soon after, and by December, Gerald was preparing to advance on Regulus itself. The surviving members of the Salaj family did not wait around any longer, and in the new year up and left the Free Worlds entirely, taking their vast fortunes with them out into the Magistracy. Those left behind were imprisoned or executed. 
In their place, House Schenk was elevated to the position of Duke of Regulus. Because the situation had not come to a conclusive end, House Large had escaped after all, Jedold could continue to cast them as a grave threat to the stability of the League and justify his continued suppression of personal liberties and expansion of safe. The Free World was, in effect, becoming a police state. The Principality of Regulus would never be the same again. What had once been a founding member of the League was broken into three distinct districts, the two new ones being the Regulum Free States and Rim Collective. The Principality itself became a federal protectorate, but this decision opened the door to a different kind of political upheaval. The proliferation and success of the Larenth water purification process had resulted in a great many new colonies being established across the Inner Sphere. One of these was the Camlin system in the Regulum Principality. Camlin now sought separation from Regulus and admission to the Free Worlds Parliament as an independent world. The Free Worlds League in 2588 consisted of eight provinces, two of which were less than a decade old, and a number of small independents, very few of which were powerful enough to have much sway in Parliament. Most of the provinces voted in blocks, and naturally they had goals and desires that were counter to what the Marrocks wanted. As a way to diminish their power, the judicial courts granted Camlin's request to break away from Regulus, citing in their argument the three border worlds that had swapped between the Magistracy and the League during the Reunification War. This led to a period of balkanisation for the League, which has continued ever since. The Duchy of Orloff had existed in an unofficial capacity for some time, House Orloff had been raising and fighting with their own provincial units since the Reunification War. In 2691, they separated from Orient. They maintained good relations with House Allison even after the split. The Principality of Gibson would further divide the old regular state at the turn of the century, and the Abbey District would unify as a military dictatorship not long afterwards. The Free World today has more than a hundred provinces, some no bigger than a continent. Since the Council Edict of 2650 came into effect, many of the Great Houses were forced to retire large chunks of their militaries. Particularly hard hit by this were the Draconis Combine. They got around this restriction by encouraging those soldiers to sign up as private security for businesses and bodyguards for the rich and powerful. In this way, the Combine can requisition additional troops and equipment at short notice without technically surpassing the limits imposed by Directive 30. As the fascination with ancient Japanese culture grew within the populace, it became popular, and later mandatory, for graduates of the more prestigious military academies to wear or be awarded with ceremonial wakazashi and katana. Those soldiers with little better to do during times of peace began to organise duels amongst themselves. Eventually, this grew into a formal tournament system, with each regiment having a champion who would go out to challenge other neighbouring champions. In addition, there were many so-called ronin, champions who were without an official place in the roles of the DCMS. Over time, these duels transitioned from sword fighting to mech battles. In August 2681, Amanda Kuzunoya, the champion of the 3rd Benjamin regulars, approached the SLDF base on planet, Fort Chandra, and challenged the best mech warrior inside to come out and face her in battle. She stood vigil for 10 days, repeating her challenge until the 23rd, when Lieutenant Bradley Grebers disobeyed orders and walked his mech out to meet her. A short, frenetic battle took place before the fortress walls, one that ultimately left Grebers' mech disabled. Kuzunoya marched over, raised her weapon, and fired directly into the cockpit, executing the lieutenant. This began a series of similar duels, all ending in defeat for the SLDF, with several other mech warriors dying in the process. First Lord Michael Cameron tried to talk Euros and Curator into ordering those champions to stop issuing challenges, but the coordinator's response was to claim that they were no longer under his employ, and that the rise in dueling had come about as a result of the Council Edict. Operation Cowbird began on March 12th the following year. Again, a Curator champion approached and challenged an SLDF officer to a duel, only this time, an elite lance of mechs rushed the Draconis Combine Marauder and swiftly disabled it, after which it was hurried off planet for inspection. Their orders to do so had come from the Star League Intelligence Corps, who were convinced that the Curitans had developed some new technology that would account for the string of defeats suffered by the SLDF. Unfortunately for them, upon dismantling it, they discovered that there was no new tech. It was simply the superior skills of the Combine Mech Warriors that made them unbeatable in one-on-one -on -one combat. To counter this, the SLDF established the Advanced Combat Maneuvering Skills Program on July 7th, 2682, the first elite mech warriors graduating the next summer. The initiative would later become better known as the Gunslinger Program. 
While the Star League built up a reserve of trained duelists, they issued strict orders to their units not to engage the DTMS or any other Kuritan champions. The peace was broken on Christmas Day 2687 when one of the first graduates of the program, Colonel Donovan Fresnel of the 75th Royal Hussars Regiment, faced off against Chusa Shinichi Konya of the 5th Benjamin Regulars on Minakuchi, the bout ultimately ending in a draw. As the regularity of the contest grew more frequent, it drew an increasing amount of public attention. Many news and entertainment programs, particularly in the Dragoners Combine, reported on events as if it was a sport. What many failed to realise was that this was not a friendly competition between member states, but a full-on undisclosed war over supremacy and ideology, with casualties eventually numbering more than a thousand. Perhaps the most famous and successful of the Star League champions was Colonel Daniel Allison of the 29th Royal Dragoons, whose first victory on Annapolis in 2702 ended a string of 31 unbroken victories for the Combine. He continued as his unit's champion for some years, retiring in 2742 with 59 victories to his name. There were some Rekuritans who had achieved over 70 dueling victories, including sword fights, but unlike the SLDF, they were also challenging their rivals from within their own military, therefore it is impossible to conclusively say who was the greatest champion. These duels would retroactively become known as the first hidden war of the Star League. There is some debate on how long this war lasted, or whether it even classifies as a war at all. The most comprehensive histories put the date of the last contest as being fought on December 13th, 2738. By this point, relations had completely broken down between the Terran hegemony and Draconis Combine. Two quiet years followed, during which time the coordinator was issuing new orders to his Ronin warriors. Kurita would push for the return of dueling soon after, but these later bouts were more commonly associated with another conflict. Some reports point to events in 2751 as the true end of the first hidden war, where again violence between Cameron and Kurita would briefly cease. But even then, the culture had become thoroughly ingrained by that point, and the duels would unofficially continue for another 15 years. The Gunslinger program ultimately proved effective in levelling the playing field, as in the final count, 49% ended with the DCMS the winner, while the SLDF was the victor in 47% of the duels, with the remainder ending in draws. This conflict was a slow burn, smouldering for over 50 years, during which time a number of other crises rocked the inner sphere. The end of the 27th century marked the end of the peaceful détente between the member states and their periphery associates. Though the ruling Camerons and Curitans were at odds, the citizens of both realms were enjoying the good times that the Star League had brought, as were all the others. Civil liberties had been curtailed in the Free Worlds and Capellan Confederation, but the average person was little affected by this change. Even the periphery was getting along well. One poll taken in 2665 within the Torian Concordat showed that remarkably the Camerons were more popular than the Calderons, and this was not because of any unpopularity on the part of Protector Consuela Calderon. In fact, her council peers voted her as the Star League's second lord in 2663, and she became the sole periphery leader to chair a meeting in the High Council four years later, the only time that this would happen in the history of the League. Unfortunately, at the turn of the century, there was a sickness at the heart of the Union that would lay the foundations for the upcoming disaster. Jonathan Cameron became First Lord on October 13th, 2690. Nobody knew it at the time, but Jonathan was plagued with visions of the collapse of the Star League in House Cameron. His undiagnosed mental illness meant his time in office led the League down a dark path of military build-up, a military his father Michael had been considering reducing immediately before his death. Directive 33 sent military spending through the roof. This led to a great many technological breakthroughs, a full list would be beyond the scope of this video. Many were the work of R&D director Ramve Gangestad, but the most important advancement to come from this period was the space defence system. This network of automated ground and naval batteries was built around many key hegemony worlds and was an almost unassailable wall of anti-warship defences. The technology within the STS was as close as humanity has ever come to developing true artificial intelligence, a feat that hasn't been matched in the centuries since. Unfortunately, this arms build-up was one of the first pieces of legislation that drove a wedge between the inner sphere and the periphery. Both had to endure a rise in taxes, but this was harder on those fringe worlds and was viewed as an unnecessary expense. Enticed by promises that the new military tech would proliferate into their own armies, the Great Houses were more amenable to the hegemony's new weapons. The divide between periphery and core nations became greater when the member states passed Directive 41 in 2722. Proposed as a way for the periphery to reclaim more control over their economies, the idea was for the BSLA checks and controls to be removed. 
What this actually opened the door to was for the Innisfear mega corporations to move in and ransack dozens of worlds of all their resources, then depart for greener pastures, leaving the local community and economy in ruins. The Periphery Freedom Movement was founded the following year, and was over a million members strong within a decade. A ticking clock had started up. Over the next few years, the state of affairs in the periphery only deteriorated, and before long, the many protests had turned violent. This situation came to a head on June 15th, 2733, on the Torian world of New Ganymede. The police were trying to disperse the crowd when they came under fire from unknown assailants. They promptly called in the Mech Garrison, but this only escalated things further, and before long, a firefight had broken out. In the end, over a hundred civilians were killed, and hundreds more wounded. This unfortunate event repeated itself on the Outworlds Alliance planet Savon the following year, where dozens more were killed. In the aftermath of these events, the SLDF Commanding General received a distressing report from Admiral Norumboli, the Director of Naval Planning and Strategy Subcommand. The document, known as the Hyacinth Hawk Pitcairn Pressage, warned that if something was not done to reduce periphery tensions, either Savon or the Torian world of New Vandenberg would secede from the Star League by 2745, and likely trigger a major war in doing so. Regrettably, no action was taken to correct the Star League's dangerous course, as the last decade had seen far greater calamities than the protests out in the periphery. The Star League in the 28th century was a tale of two halves, one public and one hidden. Outwardly, it was stronger and more advanced than ever before, a place where the average citizen enjoyed a quality of life that has not been matched in over 250 years. Behind the scenes, the cracks that had first appeared at the end of the good years had grown into even greater divides that threatened to become fissures into which the entire league would crumble. The origins of the Second Hidden War stemmed from the marriage of two individuals on February 20th, 2700. Mary Davian, the first prince's eldest child, and Soto Kurita, brother to the coordinator Takiro. Mary's decision threatened the Davian family and the security of the Federated Sons, so she was talked into signing the Act of Succession, which surrendered her rights, and the rights of her children, to the throne of New Avalon. However, upon Mary's death on September 18th, 2715, her eldest son Vincent came forward to proclaim himself as the next First Prince. Takiro Kirita supported his claims and sent emissaries to Mary's brother, the now First Prince Joseph Davian. Joseph dismissed the Kiritan suggestions out of hand and instead named his son Richard as his heir as he had always planned. Rather than rage or attack, Takiro took the matter to the High Council, producing evidence that Mary was coerced into signing the Act of Succession. In response, Jonathan Cameron formed the Davian Succession Board to resolve the issue. This might have been the end of it were it not for the coordinator's nephew, Riki Kurita, Keeper of the House Honor, whose interpretations of the sacred dictum honorium which guides Kurita's society led to Kiro to believe that action was both right and honorable. And so, he began making preparations. The Second Hidden War, better known as the War of Davian Succession, was about to kick off all along the Draconis Fed Sun's border. Going into 2725, things were quiet despite the tension. Jonathan Cameron had declared that until the Davian Succession Board reached a conclusion, in the event of an unexpected or sudden death for the First Prince, the Curita claim would be immediately dismissed. The Davians considered this enough security to deter an aggressive move on the part of their rivals. But some within the SLDF could see the writing on the wall, however. Vice Admiral Norumboli saw the war was imminent and was spending his time identifying which of the various units that were slowly manoeuvring towards the front would soon be crossing the border. Unfortunately, no one acted on what would in time prove to be his almost prophetic predictions. By April 2725, Takiro Kurita had run out of patience and launched the invasion he had been planning for the last decade. The unimaginatively named Task Force Samurai would lead the campaign. This ad hoc division consisted of the 11th and 14th Benjamin Regulars, the 1st and 8th Galadon Regulars, the former of which brought with them their full brigade of infantry and armor support, and the 4th Sword of Light Brigade, which was also a combined arms unit. On the 16th of April, they descended en masse onto Marduk, and by May 24th had overwhelmed the defending 1st Evelyn Hussars, who retreated off-world. They began construction of a major staging post that would act as a springboard to future planetary invasions. From here though, things would become more challenging, as the element of surprise had been lost. Over the next three weeks, the regiments of Task Force Samurai split up and moved on to their individual targets. The regulars headed for the lightly defended planets Dobson, New Iverson and Royal, while the 4th Sword of Light Brigade departed for a confrontation on Breed. 
The AWFS commander for this region of the Draconis March was General Lorne Kesson, and when word reached him of the attack, he hastily sprang into action. He had no way of knowing where the DCMS would strike next, but he correctly wagered that an offensive of his own would force them to divert troops for the defence of their own realm. With that in mind, he led the 3rd Deviant Guards across the border to Ludwig, arriving around the same time that the Combine Regulars were making landfall behind him. Other AWFS units followed Kesem's example beginning on August 8th. The 14th and 16th Avalon Hussars, plus the 1st Robinson Chevaliers, moved against Hamam, Junction and Donanak respectively, but without the years of planning that the Curitan units had, their effectiveness was limited. By year's end, the war had spread to nine worlds. Royal had fallen to the Combine, and Breed might have done the same were it not for the timely arrival of the 4th Davian Guards. Nevertheless, they faced an uphill struggle against the larger Sword of Light Brigade. The AWFS scored their first victory in early 2726 on Hamam, but their compatriots were having a tougher time of it against the disciplined Benjamin regulars. More bad news came on April 18th with the defeat of the 4th Davian Guards and the loss of Breed. The unit had almost been destroyed, but had inflicted a heavy toll on the 10th Sword of Light Regiment. Their sister sword regiments did not long delay before departing again, the 11th arriving on Clathandu by the 5th of June. When reinforcements began arriving at Donanak and Junction, the entire Davian front looked in danger of collapse. By this point, most of the AWFS expeditionary force was cut off and without means of escape. But on June 24th, a timely victory for General Kesem at Ludwig finally seemed to stem the flow and forced the DCMS to respond. The assault on Dobson had been the least successful of all the Task Force Samurai targets, so the DCMS cut their losses and withdrew to Breed to reinforce the ruined 10th Sword of Light. While the Battlemech Regiment would remain here, the rest of the Brigade departed for Ludwig in the hopes of retaking their world. Even still, the Combine advance had only slowed, not stopped. Within the week, they had successfully captured New Iverson, and the 12th Sword of Light was reaching Clovis for the next planetary invasion. The 3rd Galadin regulars had also left their homeworld of Lima on July 1st and headed for Davian space. Nevertheless, Kesem's tactic had proven at least partially successful, and similar attacks were soon underway. One of their main targets was the world of Proserpina, defended at this time by most of the Hussars Brigade. The 14th Avalon were already underway from Hamam, leaving behind them an occupation force of conventional armour, but fresh troops were dispatched as well in the form of the 7th Robertson Chevaliers. While underway, the 3rd Galadin reached Lucerne, and another planet was engulfed in war. The many regiments of the Proserpina Hussars proved a formidable challenge for the invading AWFS, and casualties on both sides quickly ramped up. Unfortunately, what they had hoped to see in the Draconis forces returning was failing to materialise. Only the 1st Galadin Regulars Brigade, and even then not all of them, launched their counterattack on Ludwig on October 15th. A Davian deep strike was launched as a last-ditch attempt to draw the invading forces back when the 7th Tank Ready Loyalists set up operations on Annapolis, and from there struck out at surrounding worlds, including the district capital of Benjamin. They would continue these strikes throughout the war. The Davian War of Succession had been raging for almost two years by this point, and the SLDF had made themselves scarce. Jonathan Cameron, ever troubled by visions of the collapse of the Star League, ordered his troops to fortify the border of the Terran hegemony, terrified that the fighting would spill over. Despite easily having the strength to put a stop to the fighting, he was paralysed by his fear. This was not true for everyone within the SLDF, however. Two years prior, work was completed on one of the most advanced military projects to come out of the Star League, the Nighthawk Powered Armour. Its combat debut had come in early 2725, and a few months later, the SAS Blackheart secretly deployed a force to Marduk and began a live fire exercise in which they repeatedly eliminated the DCMS officers without being discovered. They would later play a part in determining the best targets to end hostilities towards the war's conclusion. Both sides remained unaware of their involvement until decades later. Three offensives came to an unsuccessful end in early 2727. The first was the defeat of the 16th Avalon Hussars at Junction in January. They withdrew to Ludwig to help General Kesem hold that world. In February, the Combine called off their brief attack on Lucerne and headed instead for Royal, recognising it as a likely target for counterattack. The invasion of Proserpina also drew to a close, the retreating Davian forces having sustained losses of more than a third of their unit. They regrouped at Sheet, back across the border. The First Prince had been busy mobilising a large force that he planned to use to not only fight off the invaders, but ultimately lead a major counter-invasion of the Draconis Combine. The Crucis army began life on February 24th with only two battlemain regiments, the 4th Danib Light Cavalry and the 4th Robinson Chevaliers, but other units were mustering and would soon join with them. 
The 5th Robinson Rangers, having seen to the defence of Lucerne, was now counter-attacking New Iverson. Joseph Davian made this his first target for the Crucis army, and departed in April. While en route, Clovis fell to the 12th Sword of Light in May. Despite the numbers advantage, it took until October 28th to force the remaining battalion of Gallant and Regulars to withdraw from New Iverson back to Lima. The attention of both sides now turned towards Royal, which looked as if it would be the largest battle yet. The 6th Benjamin Regulars left their sister regiment in Donanac to finish off the wounded Robinson Chevaliers, who were operating at just 40%, while they departed to reinforce the other DCMS units on Royal. The 14th Benjamin and 3rd Galadin could only muster one regiment in strength between them, having taken 30-60% to 60 casualties in their earlier engagements. The battle for this world kicked off on August 5th, 2728, with the arrival of the First Prince and the Crucis army. Their relative parity in numbers meant that neither side could win anything more than minor victories, and soon both were entrenched. Aid came a few months later when General Kessem abandoned his hold over Ludwig to the Galadin regulars' conventional forces, and moved to reinforce Joseph Davian in May. Meanwhile, the Combine was still looking at other offensives. Their first stab at Clothandu had failed, the various regiments of the 4th Lord of Light had since regrouped on Breed, but now they were tried again with the 9th Proserpina Hussars. The AWFS regiments recuperating on Sheet had since moved to defend the planet, and now hoped they'd have better luck against the individual Proserpino units compared to the full brigade they'd faced earlier in the war. Not long after, Curitan reinforcements arrived in the form of the 4th Galadin. The 5th Robinson Rangers pursued the remaining battalion of 8th Galadin regulars back to Lima, but also broke off a detachment to move against the weakly defended Wapakonita. And finally for 2728, after three years of brutal combat, Admiral Smithwick was able to enter the Donanac system at a pirate point, and rescue what few companies of the first Robinson Chevaliers were still standing. In the new year, an emergency war summit was organised on Dahar in the hopes that more AWFS forces could be brought to bear, but tragedy struck almost immediately when Duke Stephen Hassock was killed in a dropship accident upon his arrival. This scuppered any hope of quick reinforcement for the Capellan March. The Davian Heavy Guards assaulted Colchester and won a victory for the Federated Sons later that autumn. In one day, they reduced the 5th Benjamin Regulars to less than 50% strength with the loss of only a quarter of their unit. A quick encirclement forced the Cretans to surrender. 2729 was the year where the chaos that had engulfed the Davian Cretan border started to spread across the inner sphere. A minor example of this was an opportunistic raid on Mira by a small DCMS force looking to rearm, but these were quickly defeated by the 3rd Chesterton Cavalry. Things were far worse on Earth. Jonathan Cameron's trouble bind had begun to seriously affect his running of the Terran hegemony in the Star League. The war between two of its most powerful members and the First Lord's complete lack of action to resolve it pushed some of his most senior staff to act against him. On May 13th, Commanding General Ikolov Fridasa, BSLA Commander Gregory Wallace, and Revenue Director Bryce Hinchcliffe IV approached Jonathan's pious sister, the mother Jocasta Cameron and presented her with evidence of her brother's illness, urging her to take the reins. Jocasta though was unmoved, and declared that she belonged at her Scottish convent and not at Unity City. This was not the answer the three conspirators had been hoping for, but undeterred, they began to spread rumours that Jocasta was plotting a coup against Jonathan, in the hopes that more would flock to her side and force her hand. The Reverend Mother was abhorred when she discovered this, and went straight to the First Lord. The trio soon found themselves convicted of treason, and condemned to death on the 2nd of August, but their actions had nonetheless brought about their goals. In the aftermath, the two siblings realised how bad the situation had become, and agreed to rule in unison as of August 19th, 2729. One of their first appointments was the new commanding general, Rebecca Fetladrol. She took office on September 13th, and began planning the SLDF intervention, codenamed Operation Smother. Unfortunately, this internal crisis had taken most of the year to resolve, and by this point, the battle on Royal was reaching a crescendo. It was a frenzy that would sadly cost First Prince Joseph Davian his life. His mech was incapacitated during the fighting on October 20th, after which the Curitan infantry swarmed over it, extracted Joseph from the cockpit, and then brutally beheaded him. Only the brave actions of Thomas Green Davian allowed the retreating AWFS forces to recover the Prince's body before lifting off Weld to bolster the defence of Robinson. For his actions, Thomas was granted the position of regent for the Capellan March until the young Duchess Rita Hassett came of age. The Second Sword of Light arrived at Royal soon after, with plans to potentially strike at the Draconis March capital. When word of Joseph Davian's death spread, it was the killing blow for all other AWFS operations in the region. The Tancredi Loyalists, who had spent three years operating in Draconis Combine space, returned to the Federated Sons. 
Only the first Avalon Hussars, newly refitted after their defeat at Marduk some four years prior, and led by the Duke of Robinson, Vasily Sandoval, were able to continue with their counter-attack on Fallon, where a small detachment of the 4th Sword of Light Brigade was making an opportunistic strike far from the main body of the fighting. Operation Smother was launched on November 8th. Five SLDF divisions were mobilised and dispatched to the front lines, each targeting a different contested world, making landfall almost simultaneously. The 26th Graham and 39th Danabola Royal Battlemate divisions made landfall on Lima and Wapakoneta, whereafter the Robinson Rangers immediately suspended hostilities. Likewise on Clathandu, the 159th Athena Royal Mechanised Infantry Division brought about a ceasefire without incident. The 4th Sword of Light Brigade attempted to contest Breed, but the 1st Jump Infantry Division, alongside supporting elements from the 21st Royal Jump Infantry Division, were able to force a surrender by December 16th. Lastly, the 160th Sirius Battlemate Division arrived on Royal alongside the 1st Avalon Hussars and faced stronger opposition before finally concluding the contest there in early 2730. The Hussars then had been involved in both the opening and closing actions of the war. As an historical footnote, one of the descendants of the bodyguard that had lost her life protecting Nicholas Cameron from the mad Lena Carita some 100 years prior saw his first action at Royal, a young Alexander Kerensky. When his regiment's entire command staff was wiped out during landing, his quick actions saved the unit and began a meteoric rise up the chain of command, becoming Fetladjol's aide and eventual successor in just 10 years. A decisive Jocasta Cameron now stepped forward to dictate terms. Her position as co-ruler had become official on December 29th. First of all, the Kirita claim to the Davian throne was completely overruled. The evidence for Mary Davian's coercion that they had tried to present had been found to be falsified. All borders were reset to how they had been pre-war. But it was her next act that would have long-term negative repercussions for the Star League. She assigned blame to both sides for resolving the issue through conflict. Takiro Kirita was livid and his response was entirely predictable. The Draconis Combine, which had never been close participants in the Star League, withdrew in all but name. Ichiro Oshiro, Minister for the Department of Indoctrination, was tasked with taking every opportunity to subvert the Star League's popularity within the realm and was exceptionally successful at this. As an aside, Takiro reorganised the Sword of Light Brigade after the war on account of their mediocre performance. From then until now, the brigade would consist of five reinforced regiments, each based around one of the five pillars of the Draconis Combine society. But just because Kirita was angry didn't mean that young Fresh Prince Richard Davian was any happier with the outcome. The promises that Ian Cameron had made 150 years earlier about coming to their aid in the event of conflict had not been fulfilled. His father had been petitioning the Star League for assistance from the very first week and all throughout the war, but to no avail. Simply because their defensive strategy had involved counterattacks within the Draconis Combine, they were treated as a guilty party. In the aftermath, both nations made moves to isolate themselves politically and economically from the Star League. Beginning on November 26, 2730, the Fedsun's industrial base started to shift away from interstellar trade and towards self-sufficiency. On August 24, 2735, Richard Davian passed the Preparedness Act, which sought to create a vast militia force that could quickly mobilise at short notice in the case of future invasions from their neighbours. The AFFS had taken a huge hit to their credibility due to their inability to save the life of the First Prince, and now morale was at an all-time low. This poor state of affairs would continue for the better part of two decades, until in 2748, Colonel Mitchell Stopek of the 4th Davian Guards, one of the units whose reputation had been most tarnished, challenged the most recent winners of the Martial Olympiad's regimental tournament. The hard-fought victory that followed finally shook off the malaise, and Stopek, who had lost an eye in the engagement, was awarded the title of Prince's Champion. During this time, the AFFS had been undergoing an enormous arms build-up, manufacturing far more mechs and vehicles than they theoretically had the soldiers to crew. The Council Edict of 2650 only limited personnel, not materiel, and they took full advantage of this loophole, and nor were they the only ones working around the military restrictions. The Draconis Combine had found their loophole with the Ronin. The Capellans had raised dozens of Home Guard regiments outside the chain of command, reporting instead to the individual duchies and the Free Worlds had reduced their federal forces to all-time lows while continually growing their provincial ones. That was a decision that was about to lead to disaster. In the final years of the Second Hidden War, the turmoil that had engulfed the Draconis Combine and Federated Sons was spreading to other nations. While the problems within the Terran hegemony were resolved without major issue, 
The same could not be said for the Free Worlds League, which was about to descend into a succession crisis of its own. The unrest had been brewing since the Salage Purge the previous century. When Gerald Merrick passed away back in 2703 and the Captain Generalcy went to his daughter Elise, it was the firm hope of everyone in government that she would reverse some of her father's controversial authoritarian surveillance policies. They were immediately disabused of that notion when she proclaimed that Gerald's death by natural causes was actually the work of an assassin. A political purge followed, the scale of which far surpassed anything undertaken by her predecessor. Under Elise Merrick, the intelligence agency SAFE took on the role of secret police. The first Free Will's guard on Atreus experienced a dark period in its history when they became Merrick's favourite tool to dispatch and destroy the private militaries and bodyguards of anyone who spoke against her, racking up a notable kill count on their own citizens. After another two decades of oppressive rule, elements within the Free World's government approached Elise's brother Oliver, who had been living on Procyon within the Terran hegemony, beyond his sister's reach, and encouraged him to step forward as a rival. Oliver was little interested in their plight, and declared that it was them who needed to act against Elise. Four years later, on November 21st, 2728, they did just that when they declared this large crisis was over and moved to strip Elise of her wartime title of Captain General. Merrick's response came early the following year when she disbanded Parliament entirely on February 3rd. A third of the MPs were arrested and tried for treason. Thankfully, several of the most prominent and powerful were able to escape the coup, and once again they approached Oliver. This time, the younger brother was forced to act, seeing clearly that his sister was out of control and needed to be removed from office. On Callaway 6th, he established a government in exile, and on March 31st, proclaimed himself Star League Council Lord for the Free Worlds, bestowing the title of Captain General onto his son Boris. The Civil War had begun. The various provinces soon took sides. By April 14th, the rebels had won the support of the duchies of Orient, Andurian, Orloff and Kaladasa, the most senior of which was Grand Duke Martin Allison. Nine days later, the loyalists of Stuart and Regulus declared for a lease. Earl Aldridge Stuart was the director of SAFE, and therefore a close ally, while House Schenk had ruled the Regulan Principality during its time as a federal protectorate, though that honour had been removed when it regained its independence. Its current ruler, Duchess Elsa Cameron Jones, was somewhat cooler towards both sides. The various federal units sided with Elise, as did the Marek Guard. The 12 regiments of Marek Militia, who were the traditional power behind the Atrian throne, remained mostly loyal, except for the 3rd and 8th Marek Militia on McKenna and New Delos. Fighting began towards the end of May, when the Marek Militia assaulted the provincial capital of Orient, facing off against the Orient Hussars. Meanwhile, Boris Marek took the fight to Regulus, while Duke Martin Humphreys led his Andurian defenders against Aviord in what would become the longest battle of the war. These offensives had the desired effect, and soon the Loyalist forces were withdrawing to aid in the defence, arriving back within Elisa's territory by late July. The rebels kept their momentum up by beginning the Siege of Harmony that same month. The Loyalists went back on the offensive in early 2730, with an attack against the new Praha, but some of their forces had to be deployed internally as anti-Elise riots had begun to flare up, particularly on the world of Helos Minor. This left the Free World's capital of Atreus vulnerable, a weakness that Boris Marek was quick to exploit when he led an invasion of the world on March 29th. With this assault, open warfare had made it to the capitals of each of the founding provinces of the League, something that few other of the Star League members and future successor states have experienced. The assault on the capital city raged non-stop for 36 hours, at the end of which Boris's forces broke through and he was able to capture his aunt. Elsewhere in the Marek Commonwealth, his troops were invading Ariel and New Olympia. Momentum appeared to be with Oliver's faction. However, the anticipated surrender following the capture of Elise never materialised, and into his mother's shoes stepped her son Bertram. He would soon prove himself to be an excellent commander, and so the war dragged on. General Karol Vashkov had almost succeeded in destroying the Marek Guard on Ariel, but the planet was eventually liberated by Loyalist forces, and they made a strike of their own against Dalton. Their main target was the rebel Duke of Carbonis, whose Orloff Grenadiers had for the time being not participated in the war. Fighting continued for a full year into 2731, towards the end of which the Duke's few remaining troops were able to finally secure a dropship long enough for them to escape off-world. Nevertheless, it was a major loss for the rebels in terms of manpower and resources. The war then stagnated for the best part of two years. 2733 finally saw the rebel cause start to collapse. The first regular Hussars struck a supply dump on New Delos, where they faced off against the Fusiliers of Orient, who had until this time remained apart from the fighting. 
The long sieges of Avior and Harmony were finally broken thanks largely to the efforts of Bertram Marek. He next set his sights on rescuing his imprisoned mother. The counter-invasion of Atreus began on February 9th, 2734. Sadly, her always shaky mental state had been irrevocably damaged during her incarceration, and Bertram realised that it was now his duty to lead the entire realm, and not just the loyalist military. Messages were dispatched to Audience calling for a truce. Oliver received them gratefully, and agreed to meet on Tiber to hammer out the details of a permanent ceasefire. The Treaty of Verona was signed on the 20th of May, bringing an end to the civil war. The terms of the treaty saw Bertram sworn in as the new Captain General. The various dukes were all pardoned for their involvement after Elise was declared to have erred in her judgement in her later years. The 70-year-old Oliver Maddock, however, was tried, found guilty of sedition and executed on July 12th. His son Boris died in an escape attempt two years later. As was the case during General Maddock's Salage Purge the previous century, the Star League chose to remain aloof and take no part other than to ensure that the Lyrans nor Capellans make any opportunistic land grabs. While this may have been for the best, it nevertheless put a strain on Bertrand's relationship with the ruling Camerons. He did not take such extreme actions as the Spinwood member states, but the Free Worlds grew distant following the Civil War. Jonathan Cameron passed away on September 7th, 2738, after suffering a fatal stroke. His sister Jocasta stepped down and handed the reins to her nephew, Simon Cameron, before withdrawing back to her abbey at St. Joan. Simon had a strong reputation, coming from several years as Director General of the Terran Hegemony. He was both idealistic and authoritative, and with the support of the Council Lords, he would likely have been able to reverse the deteriorating situation across the League. Unfortunately, he inherited a realm that was anything but united. It is no doubt indicative of just how far the Star League had gone down a dark path that the Inner Sphere experienced only a brief respite at the conclusion of the last two major conflicts before a third hidden war flared up, and once again the Great Houses were at each other's throats. Until this point, the fighting had been contained either along a single border or within one of the member states. Not so for this new conflict. It combined the scale of the more recent wars with the insidiousness of the Kurita duels. The Lyran Commonwealth had so far managed to remain apart from the escalating tension, and for the most part it was business as usual for the industrious Lyrans. As the new decade rolled around, a steadily increasing number of bandits and pirate raids began along the periphery edge of that realm. This culminated in the shocking attack against the Edge on September 2nd, 2741, in which the local garrison was overrun and some 500 civilians were slaughtered. The Lyran Intelligence Corps jumped into action and were able to trace the pirate unit back to the Rimworld's planet of Butthold. The 12th Lyran regulars were sent in on June 19th, 2742 and cleared out the pirate base. Afterwards though, they interrogated the few survivors and discovered that they were not mere bandits, but rather a mercenary unit in the employ of the Draconis Combine that had hidden their identity. Archon Michael Steiner II was in disbelief at this revelation, and later that year confronted Takiro Curator at the Winter High Council session. The coordinator didn't even have the decency to deny the allegation, and merely retorted that business is business, to which the normally stoic Lyran flew into a rage and physically assaulted his fellow council lord. After the two were separated, they each demanded that the First Lord take immediate action against the other, but the newly appointed and inexperienced Simon Cameron seemed too shocked by the outburst to do so. The Archon made a public declaration decrying the actions of Curita. The coordinator's response followed soon after, and both sides girded for war. Beginning on January 4th, Lyran troops began massing at the border. On Tamar, five brigades prepared to go on an offensive, while others took up positions at Settelitcher, Oldenmarkt, and Camlin. The DCMS mirrored them, and by February 26th had fortified Razalhag, Radstad, and Alshain. But now Simon Cameron stepped in to curtail any chance of another major war between member states, and on March 28th dispatched naval detachments from the 10th and 16th fleets to restore order. Unfortunately, the cat was out of the bag, and before long, small-scale raids and skirmishes were occurring along almost every border in the Star League. When confronted, the Council Lords claimed to have no knowledge or involvement and put the attacks down to overzealous local commanders. But when the Star League Intelligence Corps produced evidence to the contrary, their new response was to promise retaliatory strikes against their rivals, rather than de-escalate the aggressive actions of their own commanders. By the following summer, enough evidence had been gathered to conclusively prove that every state was engaged in these tit-for-tat raids. On June 7th, 2744, 
Cameron changed his approach, commanding his troops to shoot on sight any enemy force that didn't immediately identify itself and surrender. From here, things escalated further as the so-called bandits began to travel with warship escorts, further dispelling the illusion that they didn't have backing from the Great Houses. At the end of 2745, on the 13th of December, the Free World's merchant vessel Timothy Leary was mistakenly destroyed at Vector by the Lyra Navy on suspicion of transporting illegal goods and narcotics into Steiner space. Tensions between the two, always shaky, now soared until it seemed a certainty that there would be open war. As it transpired, the only thing that prevented it was internal strife within the Free World's League. Captain General Ewan Marrick dispatched orders to the various provincial forces to meet him at a staging post on Solaris in preparation for the assault. The Free Will's guards took point and waited for their reinforcements. The Fusiliers of Orient dutifully arrived not long afterwards, but it soon became apparent that no one else had heeded Ewan's call. Both the Principality of Regulus and Duchy of Andorian refused. Ultimately, it fell to the Juggernaut Regiment of the Stuart Dragoons to step up and take their place. The large part of the blame for this must be laid at Ewan's own feet. He was a deeply unpopular leader, a drunk and a blackguard, and he had steadily isolated himself from any potential support. In one incident, he brutally beat his own son, causing some within the Free World's Parliament to rally behind Kenyon Marrick's side, chief among them, old David Stewart. The recency of the Marrick Civil War prevented any of these talks from going further, but it would help build a solid base of power for Kenyon later in life. By July 6, 2749, the FWLM was in position on Solaris and Uhuru, while the LCAF responded by moving troops to New Kyoto on August 7. Once again, Simon Cameron intervened and sent in the Navy. By the 10th of September, the 8th and 11th fleets had moved to Solaris and New Kyoto respectively. Miraculously, large-scale warfare was once again averted. The Star League Defense Force did not escape unscathed the pointless fighting that marked the mid-28th century. In 2749, the Prince of Raselhag signed off on the ill-conceived assassination of the SLDF's 3rd Regimental Combat Team's commander, whom he saw as a hostile occupation force, rather than peacekeepers. Justice was swift and the regiments of the 3rd RCT quickly brought him to heel, in the process earning themselves the nickname the Iridani Light Horse. The precise end of the Third Hidden War is impossible to determine, since none of the participants even acknowledged that they were fighting. The more blatant tactic of using one's own military and blaming it on local commands largely died out by 2752, which is the most commonly accepted endpoint. For the SLDF though, the war, as they had simply taken to calling it, continued on unabated. Banditry increased across the Inner Sphere, and reports indicated that between 25-50% to 50 of these attacks were sponsored by foreign realms. In some instances, corporations even hired bandits to attack their competitors within their own state. Some historians claim that the phony war of the late 28th century was actually still the same conflict, and other, more fringe elements suggest that it is still going on to this very day in 3025. The Star League in 2750 was at a crossroads. Internal bickering, political backstabbing, and even undeclared wars had shaken the once mighty alliance to its very foundations. If it continued on this path, then it would mean the end of the League and a return to the constant state of war that had defined the previous age. One alternate road was still open however, even at this late hour. The common people, who had themselves become disillusioned, could rally together and demand better of their rulers and a cessation to the growing conflicts. In 2750, the only person who could start such a revolution and put the brakes on the Star League's continued decline was the man at its very epoch, First Lord Simon Cameron. Cameron could see that the council laws were beyond the reason of himself or his diplomats, and so he began making preparations for an ambitious peace tour across the Inner Sphere. He aimed to talk to the local populations in the hope that they might be able to force their leaders to change their ways. Such a voyage was unprecedented in the era of the Star League. Medievalism was all the rage at this point in history, mostly credited to the works of novelist Mina Samuels, and the First Lord likened his journey to that of a king's progress. Samuels actually had a place in Cameron's inner circle as his ethics advisor, and was with him during the first leg of the tour. On March 21st, 2750, he set out on his tour of the Inner Sphere, a journey that would ultimately prove to be his last. He was escorted by the largest naval fleet ever put together, a poetic metaphor for the colossal SLDF's inability to prevent the impending chaos. His first destination was the Lyran Commonwealth, where he stopped at Skye and Ferrillo in April. Immediately, he began to see a positive increase in opinion polls. 
Sticking to his cause, he politely declined the invitation from Duchess Joan Lestrade to meet with the nobility of the Federation of Sky. In May, he travelled to Donegal, but despite its close proximity, never went to Tharkad. It was a snub that led the Lyran-affiliated news broadcast to discuss his voyage with cynicism, if at all. Similarly rebuffed were the Duke of Alarion, Rinson Hampula Surfas, and the Duchess of Tamar, Monique Kelswa. Coventry followed in June, New Cape Town in July, then Mississauga in August, Zongshan in September, and Jahar in October. Then, he crossed the border into the Rimworlds, again skirting around the capital Apollo to visit Wotan in December and Steelton in January. Preparations were underway to reach Razalhag and the Draconis Combine by June to hold a rare council meeting away from Terra. Several states refused to attend, the Taurian Concordat, Magisteria of Canopus, Capellan Confederation, and Federated Sons, but he received confirmation from the other rulers that they would be in attendance. As he turned and headed for Chacona space, he made a detour to visit Star's End, a stop that wasn't on his itinerary. The mining operation at New Celestia had piqued his interest, however, and he had the time for a diversion. On February 17th, 2751, Simon and his entourage were descending to the 42nd level of the Consolidated Titanium's mining site. In Tunnel 5T, he was invited to try his hand at piloting one of the remote-operated machines that excavated the rocky asteroid. On account of his familiarity with neuro helmets, he gladly accepted and took to the controls like a natural. Then, in an instant, the course of humanity changed forever. The machine turned and rushed the porthole, smashing through the glass, and those who were not killed instantly were exposed to the vacuum of space. And then, it was over, and the Starleague's fate was sealed.